One of the major topics in social cognition has, from the very beginning, has been the study of how we recognise the expressions in faces. And there are, it turns out there are the five basic expressions which include happiness, sadness, disgust, fear and surprise. Um, when brain imaging was added to the mix, it was possible to identify brain regions that were particularly concerned with these kinds of expressions, like the amygdala is very interested in fear, the insula is very interested in disgust. But also it was found that our response to emotional expressions in faces is part of the mirror system. This is a system where we have common neural basis for recognising something and for doing something. So when I see a happy expression or a fearful expression, the same bits of the brain light up as when I have, when I feel happy or when I feel fear. And people immediately recognise that this might be an interesting basis for empathy. But it turns out that empathy is actually rather complicated. One of the things I find fascinating is that the word doesn't come into the English language until the beginning of the 20th century, which is remarkably late. It comes from the word, German word Einfühlung, which is to feel yourself into a situation. And people used to talk about how you would appreciate art because somehow the, the picture that you're looking at causes you to feel the emotions that the artist is trying to present to you. And the discovery of this mirroring system in the brain seemed to be a direct um, representation of this kind of experience. But as I said, things are slightly more complicated. So one of the first things that was found when we were imaging um, responses to fear, for example, is that you'll get a fearful response even if the face is presented so quickly that you're not aware that you have seen a fearful face. And other people in Sweden also demonstrated that you can measure expression changes in your own face by recording activity in muscles and you can show that your muscles are activated so that you're actually demonstrating generating a fearful expression in your muscles when you see this face. And again, this happens even if you're not aware that you have seen a fearful face. So this doesn't sound to me like empathy, because our usual understanding of empathy is I somehow notice that you're feeling a certain emotion, and I am aware that you're feeling a certain emotion, and I may feel it myself, and I may want to actually do something about it. So if you're feeling very unhappy, I may want to cheer you up. But these, this very basic neural empathy, might, which you're not even aware that you've seen the fearful expression, might better be called contagion. And people often call this emotional contagion, and you can get motor contagion when you tend to imitate the actions of others, and so on and so on, without knowing that you're doing it. So probably there are at least three levels of empathy. There's emotional contagion, where I feel your emotion, even though I'm not aware that it's your emotion or that I'm feeling it. There's, I feel your emotion and know that it's your emotion and not my emotion, although I am reflecting it to some extent. And then at the other extreme, there's, I know that you're having an emotion and I, as a result of this, I want to help you. So if you're feeling sad, I want to cheer you up. And it would seem to me the case that if you're feeling sad and I start feeling sad as well, this is probably not the best way to achieve this. And there are even more important situations whereby if I see an angry expression, it's probably not ideal to be angry myself. So things become more complicated as soon as you bring in these higher level cognitive processes into the study of empathy. Another mirror system exists for pain, which again depends in part on, social, on, on facial expressions. So if I see someone with an expression of pain, I will also feel that emotion, if one can call it an emotion, 
but you can do this more directly. You can actually show people receiving painful stimuli. So this has been done in various ways, but for example, you see the hand, of, you are in the scanner, and on the screen in front of you, you see somebody's hand and you see a needle sticking into it, or you see a cotton bud stroking it. And the interesting thing here is that when you see a needle sticking into someone's hand, the areas in your brain that respond to pain light up, which is the anterior cingulus and the anterior insula. And these are the same areas that light up when you yourself have a needle stuck into you in the scanner. So there's this overlap. And they will even light up when, rather than seeing someone having a needle stuck into them, you're simply told when the light goes on, the person is going to receive a painful stimuli. So simply knowing when your companion is going to receive this painful stimuli, you see a painful response in yourself. And again, this can be an example of empathy. But again, life is more complicated. You can then ask the question, does it matter who you see getting the painful stimuli? And one experiment that I did with Tanya Singer, she manipulated people's belief about who it was that was getting the pain. So basically she made them believe that this was a nice person or a nasty person. And this was done by having these people who were actually actors who were brought in for the experiment play a game with the subject of the experiment or the participant in the experiment. And one, on, one actor was told to cheat and the other actor is told to be cooperative and they very rapidly get a reputation of being nice or nasty. And then when you see them getting the pain in the scanner, you're much less responsive if it's the nasty person getting this pain, particularly if you're a man. And there was even some suggestion that men in particular, when they saw the nasty person getting the pain, actually the reward system in the brain lit up. So that's one aspect which we may not be surprised about. The other aspect which is more disturbing is that it depends whether the person you see getting the pain is the same race as you or not. So some colleagues in Beijing scan people and it's actually the setup, but either you had a Caucasian in the scanner and they could see a Caucasian face having a needle stuck into it or a Chinese face having a needle stuck into it. Or it's a Chinese person in the scanner with exactly the same situation. And the Caucasians respond empathetically when they see a Caucasian face getting the painful stimuli and not with a Chinese face. And precisely the reverse with the Chinese participants. So this is a powerful demonstration of how much our empathy is to do with our in-group and not to do with our out-group. You can obviously ask the question, can you overcome this prejudice? And here there are experiments suggesting that this can be done and there are roughly two ways you can, if you know, I guess the main way is to know the people so all these experiments I've described are done with faces of people you have no idea who they are. If you get to learn, if you get to know someone of a different race, if they become part of your team, then the empathy comes back. A very tough question in all this social cognition is the extent to which these processes are innate rather than learned from our culture and our environment. And I would say that this is me speculating, although it's a sort of experiments that I would like to do in the future. We all come from the factory, as it were, hardwired, but these can be overcome. So certainly very young infants already show signs of prejudice, but depending on the culture in which they find themselves, these can rapidly be overcome. There's a nice experiment, a much simpler kind, about 
faces again. I seem to be always talking about faces. Um, with these new computerized faces, you can morph between faces of different races or different people from different countries. So you can have a Caucasian face at one end and a Japanese face at the other end, and you can have all possible intermediate faces. You can then ask people in different cultures, in a sense, where the cutoff is. So if you ask people in America, at what point does it look no longer look like an American face? It's much closer to the American than it is to the Japanese. If you ask people in Japan, what, where does it change from a Japanese face to a, a Caucasian face? It's much closer to the Japanese end. So this is an example of a sort of prejudice, if you like. But this is purely created by the environment in which you find yourself. So if you take an American from America to Japan, where they're now surrounded by Japanese faces, this neutral position moves because it's influenced by the majority of the people that you see. So I think this is a nice example of how these factory settings, as it were, can be modified by the environment in which you find yourself.